The second month, I got a bill in the mail from a major corporation. And they said to Mrs. Pryor, your name is on the dotted line. This corporation is all over the world, but it's in my city too. And so with my, my husband's death, everybody in the city basically knew about it because it was aired day and night. It was on all the billboards in our city. They even blocked off streets in our city for the funeral. So these people knew about his death. The letter said, Mrs. Pryor, your name is on this dotted line along with your husband. And even though he is deceased, you owe us almost a half a million dollars. Day and night they call me. Early in the morning. Five, six, seven, eight times a day my phone rang. Even though I explained to them my situation. You know how you have to expose just about everything. My attorney said to me, Miss Fryer, stop answering the phone. He said, that's the way they operate. They're trying to wear you down. I said, all right. I thought about the word of the Lord. I thought about how my, business, my husband had sown into ministry and how he had sent a lot of students to college and how he invested in people and how a lot of pastors, even in his jurisdiction, he had sown out of his own pocket into them. You know how you bishops, you know how you do, right? And I thought about that. I said, God, I, 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 just, I just don't believe. I just don't believe I'm going to go out like this. And I said, I just don't believe it. I don't want to take a penny of my money. I don't want to take any of it. But they kept calling me. When it wasn't a phone call, it was letters. Every day, every day, they sent a letter to my house. I tear it up, throw it in the wastebasket. I said, God, the fight is on. I said, you promised in your word that you would never leave me nor forsake me. I didn't stop going to church. See, sometimes when we get in trouble, the thing we do, we go and get in our bedroom, pull a cover over our head, and just cry and moan and just throw in the towel. I'm not going to church. I don't want anybody to talk to me. I, I knew I couldn't win him like that. I knew I couldn't defeat this thing like that. I kept putting on my clothes. Every noonday, I would go to church. In the morning when my pastor would call 6 o'clock prayer, I would try to go to 6 o'clock prayer. My children said to me, Mother... God can hear you in your bedroom. You don't have to keep going out there to church. But as Richard Hinton said, Porsche had come to show. And I knew if I was going to win this thing, the fight was on. So I told the devil, I got the word of the Lord out. I did like uh, Superintendent Otis Lockett said, you got to get you a God said. You have to get into the word and know it well enough. So whenever the devil throws something at you, you got a word to throw back at. I start throwing the word of the Lord back. I remember in one instance that people say you're crazy. The, uh, Matthew 6 and 6 said, go in your secret closet and pray to the Father. At this time, things were pressing. The grief, the stress, the anxiety. And the Spirit spoke to me and said, Ruth, I know it may not literally mean to go in the closet, but you do what it takes to get you through. Bishop Hines, I opened up that door, and I went in that closet, laid down on that floor, and I said, Jesus! I had to persevere. I knew I just couldn't call him one time and jump up because the devil sometimes doesn't, that, that doesn't disturb him much. I just kept on. I didn't care who was in the house. I just called Jesus. I said, you said in your word that in the time of trouble,
I kept giving my tithes. Kept giving my summer Sunday school offering. I didn't say my husband gone now. I got to be careful and hold on to my money. Because I don't have nobody to take care of me. I, I just can't give in the special offerings. We can't sow in the seed faith offering. Son would have meetings, whatever they asked for. I was the first one to get in line. Right behind my pastor, I was there. Because I needed a breakthrough. I said, God, you're going to take good care of me. I know you are. So I just kept giving. Kept going. Kept supporting the Jewish diction. Kept going. And one day, I opened my Bible to Job 22 and 28. And the word became rain. It says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established. I ran in Mother Rivers until it got in my spirit. So I just kept saying, walking through my house, Thou shalt. It didn't say your mother shall. It didn't say your pastor shall. It said, Thou shall decree a thing, and it shall be established. I just kept on quoting. I said, You said in Malachi 3 and 11 that you would rebuke the devourer for my sake. I was not in denial. I was not trying to lie to the bank. I told them that I knew my name was on there, but I couldn't handle it. I didn't want no part of it. Evangelist Rogers, this is God knows the truth. I said, I'm not crying no more about this situation. I told my children, we're giving this one to God. And if anybody can handle it, God can. Went to the mailbox. There was a letter in the mail. It says, Dear Mrs. Ruth Pryor, your debt for almost a half a million dollars has been canceled. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I was thankful for that. But I was smart enough to know that they can have a deficiency against you if and come back on you in about five years if they see where you may be able to buy you a couple skirts. You know what I mean? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Because I knew they would be watching what went out of my account. So, I kept reading it. And it says, and there will be no deficiency against you. This entire debt has been canceled. Honey, I didn't wait till I got to the church. Because the song said, I didn't need no music. Me and the Lord at a Holy Ghost party. Right in my house. I was thanking him. I was praising him. I was twirling around. I was almost turning carefully. I was so glad that the Lord had canceled my debt. Somebody out there tonight, listen. You in a storm. If you're not in one, you're coming out of one. If you're not coming out, you're getting ready to go into one. And you've got to know if you don't rely on Jesus, if you don't get the word of the Lord in your heart, if you don't begin to get a prayer life. See, you've got to get a prayer life. You have to have a prayer life. This demon we're dealing with is not plain. He knows that his time is coming. And so he's trying to take the saints out. So we can't be ignorant. We can't sit around and just watch movies all the day, all day long. You know, I, I know somebody said that you don't go to talk about movies. I, I'm not talking against movies. I'm talking about the people who have no time for prayer and scripture reading. But they'll sit at a movie for three or four hours. That's what I'm talking about. And don't have any time for God. You're going to have to spend time with God. I could have lost my mind. But God didn't let it be. And you know what I attributed to, Mother Rivers? I attributed to the fact that because I had spent time in the presence of the Lord, because I had decided to commune with the Lord, because I had been disaster ready, didn't know it was coming, but I'd been told for years that it's time to pray. We, the people of God, we're going to miss God 
if we don't get a prayer life. I say to you wonderful young people in the choir, listen to me as a mother in Zion. You got to get a prayer life. You're going to have to spend some time in God's word and in his prayer. Singing is wonderful. But you can't lead me where you haven't been. You can be ever so wonderful with your melodious voices on the praise team and in the choir. But if you don't spend any time in prayer, let me tell you something. The old song was prophetic and it's true. There's a storm out on the ocean. And it's moving this way. And if your soul is not anchored in Jesus, you're going to drift away. Because the enemy is trying to destroy God's people. But when you know who you are, I knew I was the righteousness of God. I knew I was a child of the kingdom. I knew God had given me authority and power. And so I did just like Esther. Hallelujah. Put on me a beautiful robe and went before the Lord. When you give God what he wants, he will bless you. I didn't go in there screaming at him, telling him, why you let my husband die? Why didn't you heal my husband? I didn't get angry with him. I know those are emotions that we have, and it's because of grief. But I made up my mind, God, I don't understand it. I told him, I do not understand this, but I'm not going to try to figure it out. Because I believe he made it in. And that's all we all are after is to get in. Isn't that right? We don't want to go. But is anybody's... Are you in here tonight because you want to go to hell? No, 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 no. My objective is to get out of his saved. I believe Bishop got out of his saved. It was strong winds. It continues to be strong wind. But I take the word of the Lord. And I tell the Holy Ghost when I get in my car, sit right here. Sit right here. Hallelujah. You promised that you would be my husband. You promised that you would be my protection. You made me a promise. And I stand on the promises of God. He did it for me, but it was for his glory. Women and men of God, church, we've got to love one another. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. The Bible says that you are one flesh. You may be two different individuals, but spiritually, in God's perspective, you are one flesh. When you lose that part of you, you can't even explain it. You will never be able to explain the grief, the hurt. Love the Lord with all your heart. Let's leave a legacy to our young people that marriage is honorable. We have to stop all this divorcing in the church. It's nothing but selfishness. If both of you would get rid of all the selfishness in your life, somebody has to submit. Somebody has to compromise. When you begin to compromise, then go on your knees and pray and fast and seek God. My babies, my youngest sons, uh, 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 my, my pastor's son is named Carrington. And Pastor Chris asked him, said, Carrington, do you know what it means to fast? Carrington said, yes, I do, Daddy. He's five. He said, what does it mean to fast? He said, it means to starve. Some of us ought to start starving. Some of us ought to start doing without. And we can make these marriages work. We don't have these services to come together to just look wonderful and grand. The workshops are preaching, and I know our bishop is going to preach an anointed word on tomorrow night. But we better take heed. There's a storm out there, and it's moving this way.